One of my worst days professionally was when my boss told me, we don't have a place for you anymore. One of my best days professionally was the day after that because I got pushed off of a cliff without a parachute and I was like, what do I do? And it was really in timeline, it was really connected to this whole process of discovering my list of meaningful work. And once I understood that, I probably wasn't the greatest worker. So him choosing it for me became this kind of like, what? I, I thought I was still good for a while. And then I, no, I got to figure this out. And it really gave me out of survival, this has to change. We got to have something different. And what is it? Hi, and welcome to the Heart Leader Podcast, where our heart and our mind align. I'm your host, Amber. And today I am joined by Mark Slaybaugh. He also has a heart to be in service to all. And he's doing this by writing a wonderful masterpiece that he plans to release very soon called My Job Sucks. Now what? So Mark, thanks for being here. And I just love the title of the book. My job sucks. Now what? Where did you come up with a title? What led you to desire to write a book like this, especially coming from nonprofits and church background to something like this? Amber, thanks so much for uh, connecting here today. I've enjoyed our interaction and preparation for today. So looking forward to this conversation very much. I think really this all becomes very natural for anyone who has gone through a career transition. You have either chosen or someone else has chosen for you that your job's done. And if you've ever gone through that kind of life event, depending on who chose, you or someone else, your emotional pathway out of that life event becomes very, very different. And both of them actually can take us on a roller coaster that we don't see coming. And I've had a couple of those. And I just thought, man, there's a lot that I've learned. And hopefully I can add some value to some people and put my story into a book that becomes uh, hopefully a resource for people to help them. Because I've gone through some pretty bad transitions and a couple of good ones. That's phenomenal. And with our focus being compassion this month, what a wonderful way to show compassion. Yeah, to be willing sure. to open your own story and talk about that and say, hey, we all navigate it. So tell me about the book. What is the premise of the book? I mean, the title, I feel like, tells the story in some ways, but I'm sure there's a lot more to it than just what the title is, is presenting. Yeah. So what I'm hoping to accomplish in the book or what the book is hoping to bring to you as, as an audience is a set of clarifying questions to really get to that piece of now what to help you determine what is meaningful work for you i think a lot of us engage in work that either was presented to us it's an opportunity someone referred us friend tapped us on the shoulder said hey you should work here and we go into those opportunities and sometimes they're great sometimes they're amazing Sometimes it's easy, and so we take that path of least resistance, and we're in this place of easy. And a lot of my contemporaries are rejecting easy at this point. They don't want an easy job. They don't want, I don't want to say they don't want the paycheck, but they care less about how big the paycheck is, and they care a little bit more of a few other criterion that have been burning in their souls. And so in my own journey, there was a point, I mean, we're coming up on 10 years now, 10 years ago, I was at this place of transition and I was interviewing for these jobs that I really didn't want. I didn't resonate with them. It just seemed like it was the next, it was the next logical progression on the path that I was on. And I remember coming home from an interview is actually the second interview at this job. And I remember coming home and my wife asked me, so what do you think? And my response was, well, I guess it's fine. I guess. Yeah, I can do that. And I credit her with, I don't know if she exactly said it this way, but I credit her with kind of pushing back on me and saying, well, I'm not moving five hours away for, I guess, so you better figure it out. 
And that really sparked me into this place of what do I really want out of work? Because the path that I was on, the progression that others were telling me that I should do was not something that inspired me at all. I had no desire to do that. And I could have done it. I probably would have done okay at that job. But there came two very distinct realizations out of that. And it was number one, that I was probably wired and designed for something different than that job. And number two, someone else was wired and designed exactly for that job. And if I took that job, then the person who was wired and designed and should be there would not be there. And it became this kind of like, I don't know if you want to call it an aha moment, but it was just like this really stark realization of that's not where I'm supposed to be. But I still didn't have an answer yet, which made it even harder, right? Because when you don't have a plan, at least for me, when I don't have a plan, then like I feel the world is collapsing if there's not a plan. We got to have a plan. What's the plan? I got to have a plan. I think that that is, there's so much great information contained within that. One, you know your type. That's so critical because so many of us go around, we don't know why we feel uneasy, but we feel uneasy. And so just identifying like, do I feel better when I have a plan or do I feel confined when I have a plan? So getting to understand yourself well enough to know that is so important. But then also understanding that just plugging yourself into a situation because you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it. And it's just like putting together a puzzle. If I put myself into a place where a different piece is supposed to go, am I throwing off the whole puzzle design? And being aware enough to say, look, that's just not right for me. And so what is right for me? So then what do you do? to figure out what is right for you. That's really the question I start to ask. Okay, fine. That doesn't fit. And yeah, it would be easier because I have those skills, but it doesn't feel right or it doesn't fit. So then what do I do? Which I think gets to the next part of your book. My job sucks. Now what? I think that's where most of us get lost. What do I do then? So what would you suggest? I know you have an extensive coaching background. So what do you suggest? Really, the first thing that's most important, Amber, is you have to go on that path of self-discovery. And I don't know that everybody can do it at the same pace, but you need to understand why you're frustrated or why, you know, if you say my job sucks, why? Why are you dissatisfied with the job? Why is it not a fit? Why Why are you coming home from work dissatisfied, disenfranchised, disgruntled, whatever this you want to put with that. Why are you coming up from work not feeling like there's a sense of joy or satisfaction? I was at a job for a while that I really, like going into it, it felt like it was just a great match. And for a, for several years, it was. It worked really well and I was, it was doing well. Things were going well. I enjoyed it. But some things started to change and I found myself resisting some of the tasks or responsibilities, those things that I was owning previously. Uh, And it just became this place where I, in hindsight, I can say I probably wasn't the greatest person to work with. I probably was creating tension that didn't need to be there because of my own personal kind of tension points, my own personal rub with what I was being asked to do, what the job, you know, the seat that I had, what that seat was asking of me to do, because that's what that seat needed. I was resisting and I was pushing back on and I didn't like it. And I thought it was because, you know, my leader was asking me to do things that I shouldn't have to do or whatever, right? I think there becomes this vantage point of our own personal seat that as we shift internally and in our hearts and our minds, as we shift, we kind of expect everything else around us to shift and go with us, right? So I'm a different person today, so that job should be different today. Well, that's really not what they needed. And it was that uncomfortableness. It was the tension. It was this, like in hindsight, I don't think I was a good person to work with. I don't think people enjoyed working with me because of my own internal tension. And 
I believe that I needed to like, I needed to figure out my stuff because I wasn't in a job that I enjoyed. I probably was not an easy person to work with because of that. And so the first thing you need to do is you need to really kind of dive in to see what is it. It's easy to blame the boss. It's easy to blame the, the workplace culture. That very well could be. But I think there's also a part of it that, that, that you need to own. Because if, if all you do is say, my boss is terrible, and that's the only thing that's wrong with this, it really, in my opinion, it puts all the power on the other side and basically puts you in a victim mindset. In this effort, I'm trying to help the reader kind of take back some of that territory and put some of the power back into what you want to do in your life. And so I'm trying to help someone identify their journey. So we start with master your mindset in this idea of you need to do either some work or potentially like some battle with the garbage that's inside your head. And some of the things that that you've either told yourself or that you think, all those things, no thoughts are neutral. And you have to kind of do some assessment and perhaps some battle with the stuff that's going on in your head. You got to master your mindset. Once you can get through some of that junk, then you come back to what you said a few moments ago of like understanding yourself. I know I like to have a plan. I also know that I do not like to go to the same place every day, like a job where you show up to the office every day, 8.15, staff meeting at 9, or whatever that looks like. I just know for myself, I like a little bit more variety. I like going on site to clients and, and working with different clients. I enjoy that variety. I'm fine with one day being 12 hours or 15 hours and the next day being four. I like that. When you know those types of things about yourself, that will help you filter opportunities that come your way. There have been opportunities over the last 10 years that have come towards me and I could quickly filter them because of some of this work, because of understanding myself, because of understanding what I want out of work. And ultimately going through, you know, understanding myself, what's my wiring, what's my giftedness, what's my skills, what are the things that I'm good at, where do I find success? It ultimately led me to a place where there's essentially five, I call them five boxes. There's five boxes that have to be checked for any kind of professional opportunity. And if those five boxes are not checked, like all five, not not four out of five, all five, if all five are not checked, I say no. Are those five boxes part of your book that you offer so others can take a look at them? Yes. So the the process uh, the re- reader goes through in the book is discovering what is your criteria for meaningful work. And so you may have three boxes, you may have five, you may have seven. If you got seven, you might need to you might need to do some condensing because really for me, what I'm trying to help the reader recognize or, or assess in their own life is what are the non-negotiables? I know a lot of people want to work from home. And that's cool. If you can get that gig, if you can work from home and it, it does everything else for you, then super. But is there a price? Like, is there an income that would cause you to say, yeah, I'm totally cool with, with a commute or a travel for work that does not allow me to work, you know, 20 steps away from my bedroom every day? Is there a price? And if there is, then it's probably not a non-negotiable. So like, I have worked from home, if you will, essentially I've worked wherever I can take my laptop, but that wasn't a non-negotiable for me. And so uh, I'll I'll share a story. There was a meeting that I was supposed to attend. And I think it was over a weekend, the, uh, the chairman of that committee said, hey, we need to meet on Thursday night. And okay, so everybody goes. And that Thursday was my daughter's birthday. And I had to do a little bit of quick assessment of like, okay, how important is my attendance? How do we do this? Because it was going to be a Thursday evening. It was a Thursday evening meeting in that kind of slot where we were initially going to celebrate my daughter's birthday because of obligations or whatever. I needed to be there. I didn't see a, I didn't see a pathway of me not attending that didn't cause other problems for me. And so I went to the meeting and the person who called the meeting, the chairman, didn't show up. And I just remember coming home from that meeting and yes, 
we can celebrate my daughter's birthday the day before, the day after. Yes, I totally get that. And it doesn't always work in everybody's family to celebrate everything at the exact, I get that. I totally get that. But there were some other things that had happened too in terms of vacation. And I essentially had no control over my calendar. I went through about a 24 month period where I had such little influence over when I could go on vacation, when I could like block out my calendar and say, I'm not working that night, you know, that I came away from that. And one of my five is that I'm going to have greater control over my schedule. Now, if you have 100% complete control over your schedule, you're probably unemployed or retired, whatever. Okay. Yes, 100%. 100%. But for me, I just re- recognized at the season of life that I was in with my kids, like if I don't get to go on vacation during these windows, essentially, I'm just going on vacation with my wife and my kids have to be farmed out to other places or whatever. And it just became this thing of like, that's really important right now. In this season of life, I need greater control over my schedule. And so we just came away from that with like, that's one of my, what's one of my five criteria for meaningful work. Now. What I'm trying to take the reader through is identifying what are those non-negotiables. And in that process of discovery, hopefully asking some pointed questions that, that lead you to some self-conversation, because there's always conversation going on with yourself, that helps you identify that. And when I uncovered my five, it was just like this, it was like this relief off of my shoulders. And in fact, when I showed the list to my wife, and, and she kind of knew what I was working on. And we talked about a couple of things. But when I, when I had the five and I showed them to her, she was like, well, every job you've been interviewing for is not that. It doesn't fit any of that. I said, I know, right? So now I need to figure out what I'm going to do. What's my next job? Yeah. So the discovery of meaningful work, the list of meaningful work has for me guided my last 10 years. And it's been, it's been freeing to have that. And it plays such a huge part in that whole self-knowing and self-love as well. We somehow, at least I've noticed in all the clients that I've had, or even in my career, people somehow want to parse out. My career is over here. My personal life is over here. And from my own experience, that's never been possible. We are whole integrated beings. We can't just say, oh, my career is over here. My personal life is over here. And never shall the two meet. Right. They completely influence and impact one another. Absolutely. And by doing what you just explained, we have to really take a step back and look at how they impact and influence each other and ask ourselves, okay, so where are their points where they intersect? And we're not willing to negotiate. Like we have enough love for self that we're not going to sacrifice ourselves or sacrifice our time with our family. Like where is the pecking order? in that flow. So what an amazing practice. I will say that one of the things that my wife Deborah and I have done is I never made a promise to my kids that I would be at every sporting event that they had. I mean, we have four children and just by the pure math of what could be on the calendar, I'm either going to be, even with four kids, I'm going to be at someone else's event while another event is, is potentially happening. So we never made those kind of promises. But I wanted a greater control over how I kind of influenced my calendar. And one of the things that happened was I found that, you know, in scheduling clients and getting, you know, because I did a lot of work, I would go on site and doing travel. There usually was great flexibility and I could work around different dates and say, you know what, I just, I can't go on that date. What about these dates? And it, it all worked out and I was able to have that. But I don't want to get stuck on what one thing is as much as like, what is it for you? What is it for the, for the reader? It was just coming to that clarity. And maybe as part of my wiring, as I said, I like to have a plan. I like to know what, where I'm going and what I'm chasing. And for others, like having a list is the worst thing in the world. But what I've found is that I've talked with other folks who are going through potential transitions and they're considering things. Several people have told me, I feel like I'm in the same job that I just left. It's just in a different place. And as we investigated that a little bit and talked about like what, you know, what does that mean exactly? Essentially, they're saying the same frustrations that they had at the previous job, they have at this job. So it really wasn't about the location. It really wasn't about the boss. It really wasn't about 
the workplace culture, it was about what was going on inside of them and they hadn't really dealt with it. You know, hey, I was a product engineer over here, now I'm a product engineer over here. And it's the same thing. And so perhaps maybe there that's a sign that you're in kind of the wrong space or you're you need some other job function within that industry. So I don't want to get too far down that if if that's not where we need to talk today, but I think a lot of this has to do with you as a person. And if you can master your mindset, if you can understand yourself better, you have more of that power to navigate your world and you're not just out there allowing everything else to happen to you. And that's really what I wanted to create is this idea that it's my journey. I'm going to take control over where I'm going, what I'm going to do. And if I have that kind of ownership of my journey, I will probably come home from work with a better mindset about where my journey is taking me. And so with that as the theme, if someone has been released from a position and it was not their choice, then it can very much feel like that just happened to them and not with them. So how would this book help them understand that it's still their journey and they still are part of that path? And so they still have direction, as you mentioned. One of my worst days professionally was when my boss told me, we don't have a place for you anymore. One of my best days professionally was the day after that because I got pushed off of a cliff without a parachute and I was like, what do I do? And it was really uh, in timeline, it was really connected to this whole process of discovering my list of meaningful work. And once I understood that, and as we talked about towards the beginning, I probably wasn't the greatest worker. Like, I'm sure I was not a, you know, I was not uh, birthday cakes and balloons every day in the office. So him choosing it for me became this kind of like, uh, what? what wait what i i thought i was still good for a while and then i no i got to figure this out and it really gave me out of survival like this this has to change we got to have something different and what is it and so i would not have um i would not have been able to make that turn quickly had I not had a couple of other bumps and bruises along the way, realizing that I'm going to find something else. And so what is it going to be? And I think that's probably where a lot of people sit is if they are told, hey, today's your last day. You can go through a whole world of emotions, but one of them is probably going to be something like, I don't have any value. I, I'm not a good worker. No one else is going to want to hire me. You're going to go through those kinds of like, self-talk that garbage self-talk and it's going to affect you and mastering your mindset is i don't even know how to like it's a daily thing i i I don't know that you master your mindset one day and then it's done for the rest of your life i believe you have to continually shape and kind of guard the inputs that come into your mind and you need to develop those habits of flushing out the garbage and keep going because you have value, you just perhaps are in the wrong place today. Such great advice, because so many are looking for that magic pill that give me one thing to do once and make it all better. Yeah. And what you're talking about is a practice, it's a routine, it's something that must be done on a regular basis, just like working out. It doesn't just happen and Suddenly you go to the gym three times and you're buff and you're great until the day you're in your hundreds and you decide to leave the planet. That's right. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Not usually. So what role does compassion have in what you're building out when we're talking about clearing out that negative self-talk and being hard on yourself when things like this come up? Since we're talking about compassion this month, and way too often we have compassion for everyone else, but we don't necessarily find a way to have compassion for ourselves. Do you feel that there is a space for compassion in what you're building? Several years ago, what I would consider one of my best friends, we had like this pact, and it was 
in our own sharing of our kind of dark journeys, we made this commitment to each other like, hey, if the other one is not responding to texts or calls, uh, we have permission to chase the other guy down and like find out what's happening because we both have this tendency to withdraw. And when we get into this place of like, things are not going well. I don't feel like I have value. I don't, I don't sense that the world is, you know, whatever I hoped it would be. It's, it's everything opposite of that. And so we had this permission to like chase each other down and like literally hunt. Where are you? Why aren't you responding to my calls? And we got into that space uh, post pandemic, like within that first year of the pandemic, we got into that space where he was not responding to my, to my calls, my text. And I'm like, dude, you told me to chase you down. I'm coming for you. And like, I went to try to find him, couldn't find him. I would text him. I would call him no response, none. I would text him a screenshot of all of my uh, messages to him and no responses from him. And just like, you know, Hey, where are you, man? You need, we need to talk because this is what we agreed to. And even in that, uh, Amber, what I began to do was I began to push it back on myself and say, I'm such a loser that he won't even respond to me. And I started making it about myself and it wasn't about me. It was about him and he was struggling. And even though he wasn't responding to me, he needed me, but I couldn't find him. He wouldn't, he wouldn't respond to me. And I made it about myself. And I don't know what the right psychological term there is, but that's kind of selfish to turn that back on me and to say, you know, I'm the one who is at the center of this and he's not responding because he doesn't like me anymore. When really it was about him. It was about his journey. It was about what he needed. And we talked, we finally talked several months later, and I asked him about that. And he got silent for a little bit on the phone. And he apologized and, you know, kind of told me a little bit about what was going on. It was exactly what I was expecting it to be. It was exactly like what he and I had kind of confessed to each other. This is what I do when I get discouraged. And I just said, man, I wish you would have called me. I wish you would have answered my messages so I could have helped you. And in that moment, I needed, I needed to make it about him because it was his journey. I think part of the thing you can do most to help yourself is to be focused on others, is to give to others. Because when you do that, it takes the light off of yourself, or at least your own light. You're not casting it on yourself. You're not worried about yourself. You are being open-handed as opposed to clenched fists and and only thinking talking focusing on yourself and that sounds uh, i hope it doesn't feel like i'm trying to evade your answer or your question as much as just trying to say when you focus on yourself your world gets really really small really really fast yeah and the best thing you can do is to be focused on others so in some ways this this effort or this book it could potentially be for that person that you know is discouraged. Whereas the reader may say, you know, you know, this helps me a little bit. I I feel good about my job. Man, I know so-and-so has really been struggling. He seems like he's never happy about work. Maybe I could help him. Maybe I could help her. And that's really the thing that I would ask of you is like, if this book isn't for you, I bet you know two or three or four or five other people that it is for, and you could help them and bringing this to light for them helping them discover what they really want out of work could be some of the most valuable energy that you bring to them at any given time yeah and to me that does reflect even when you're outreaching to someone else you're still helping yourself because you're showing although it isn't about you it reflects that through you, you're helping someone else. So you can't remove yourself from the equation, but simultaneously, the world, the whole world isn't about you. Mm-hmm. It includes you, but it isn't about you. Right. And that's a beautiful way to look at it. Otherwise, we do enclose ourselves and we think that the whole world is about us. 
And so we lock ourselves into that perspective and it becomes so shut down and not inclusive. And we don't realize how much everything we do does impact the people that we care about. And so thank you for being willing to share such vulnerable story like that, because I do feel like we learn so much from each other when we're willing to do that. I have no doubt someone out there listening to this will have had some sort of similar experience and be able to relate to that and take something away from it. So thank you. for. Yeah, there was a time where um, I was going through a really hard transition early in my work career. And I don't even know the right word, Amber. I would say in hindsight, I probably was depressed. I never sought help for it. I should have. But one of the things that happened there was I thought, I was convinced no one cared. No one wanted to hear my story. I was all alone. And even with my wife, I didn't really share everything that I was processing and, and kind of what was going on in my heart and my own, in my mind. And it just simply wasn't true that no one cared. It just simply wasn't true. But that was what I believed for nearly a year was that like, I'm not calling that guy because he doesn't care. I'm not reaching out to them because he doesn't care. And that's a catch-22, right? Because we are, in many ways, as individuals, we are kind of pursuing our own thing. We all have families. We all have things that we are focused on and trying to get through the day. And if I would have, and I know the guys that I, at that time in my life, where I, I should have called John. I should have. And John would have said, dude, come over tonight. We'll, let, let's just sit out by the campfire and let's just talk. And he, that's probably what he would have said to me. But I didn't call him. I didn't tell him. He had no idea what was going on because, I mean, he's kind of doing his own thing. It wasn't like he was trying to ignore me. He just he was just doing his own thing. He didn't really even really know. And you have to have people in your life that can know. You, you have to have those people and you have to tell them because you're not, you're not alone. But we tell, we tell ourselves we're alone. And just being willing to say on a program like this, that, hey, everyone goes through it. You are a very successful individual. You are highly educated. You have an amazing family. Anyone from the outside observing you likely would not say, hey, he's navigated something where he felt this way. And the thing is, we all feel this way at some point in time. It is not an isolated feeling or an isolated event. Our careers lead us to feeling this way at different points in time. We all have these moments. The question is, what do we do with it? And having a guidebook or information, arming ourselves with tools that help carry us through those times, having people, having tools, having resources, It's the same thing that we do. We don't go to build a house and not have the wherewithal to know how to build a house and the tools to build a house. And we bring in a team that helps us build that house. We know what to do. Well, we're building ourselves in the same way. We need people. We need resources. We need the knowledge in order to keep building because we're changing all the time, Mm -hmm. constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And so it's a beautiful way to be the reflection that you're bringing forward. So I appreciate that. As a former pastor, I always have stories to tell. So I have, I have another story uh, about a friend that uh, I do call every once in a while. There's a former uh, seminary professor that I was connected to many years ago. And every once in a while, I'll call, I'll call him up. Hey, professor, how you doing? And uh, I'll just kind of lean on him a little bit he's kind of like that uncle he's that he's that encouraging uncle in my life and i'll hey professor what's going on and uh we'll just kind of lean in and say man i really feel like this is what i'm supposed to be doing but there's days that are just harder than others can you just tell me again why are we doing this why does this matter and he'll he'll laugh a little bit and then he'll go into affirming me and he'll kind of be wind behind my sails Oh, you got this, Mark. Here's why you're good at this. Here's what you should do. Uh, here's why this matters. And he'll just lean in and he'll he'll give it to me. But that's exactly what I need him to do. 
and he willingly does it to me because he cares for me. But the next morning, I got to get up and do it. Professor is not going to do it for me. I got to get up and do it. So while you have those people that can, that can you know, be that wind behind your sail, so to speak, you need to leverage it appropriately and get up and go after it the next day. Because while it may be his job to encourage me and he's great at that, it's my job to kind of get myself going. So when you have those people, treasure them, lean on them, but then get up and go. Great advice. So if someone is looking to learn more about this book that you're bringing forward or would like to lean on you in any way, just learning more about you and what you offer, how do they get a hold of you, Mark? Well, the book, which is called My Job Sucks, Now What? is going to be available on Amazon. And that by the posting of this podcast, uh, you should be able to purchase that on Amazon and uh, be able to get that copy there. Uh, I don't know if the ebook or the audio book will be available at the same time. We'll see how everything lines up. But you can purchase the book on Amazon. The second way is on our website, workchaos.com. Work, W-O-R-K-C-H-A-O-S.com. Workchaos.com is a couple of helpful resources to help you navigate that chaos. If you're in this place where you say, my job sucks, now what? And you want a fast-paced option to help you kind of navigate this journey, uh, we've got some resources for you there. So that's workchaos.com. That's amazing. And you had mentioned if there are people who feel like they are so happy in their job, and this is not for them necessarily, but they know someone who's navigating through it, would this book make an amazing gift? Would you recommend they send the individual to your website? Do you recommend both? How would you say someone shares this information to another who is maybe not so happy in their career? I would hope that you'd find some value in it to to give it to to others, uh, give the book to others. Although I will say there are times of in my life where the last thing I wanted was someone else to give me another book. So kind of navigate that carefully, right? What, what, whatever is best for that person. But yeah, if you care about them, is there a way that, that you can lead them through it? This is not a heavy read. This is, this is designed to be easy lifting. And perhaps it's uh, every Saturday morning, we're going to get together. We're going to work through this at the pace that we can. And I want to help you get to that place where you identify what is meaningful work in your life. Because it would be easy for me to just say, you know, my, my five, here's my list of five uh, criterion for meaningful work. And then you just adopt my list, but it's my list. I discovered that over like way too late in my life. Like, why did I have to discover it at 38 years old? Why couldn't I have discovered it at 28 or 18, right? All sorts of other reasons why that happened. But if you can discover that for yourself, I truly believe it's going to help you identify your path forward in the days to come. Can you walk us through a little bit more, not to give us details, because I'm certain this is a book that you really need to sit with and consume, but are there other little tips that you can give us from the book that would help us understand what we may be navigating through it? In discovering what is meaningful work for you, you need to kind of be in that place where you're comfortable having a conversation with yourself and exposing some of those thoughts and ideas to other people, which is why you need, you know, a great relationship with your spouse if you're married. If you're not married, you need to have a great relationship with some people that you can trust, whether it's, you know, the uncle who is encouraging to you as a mentor uh, or other loved ones. You need to expose your thoughts and ideas to other people because if you stay in your own little bubble, it usually goes one of two ways. Either you talk yourself into this place where you're such a loser and there's no value and you don't see anything good that you're doing, or you kind of get into this place of delusion and you're not really centered in on kind of who you are, but who you want to be. And those things aren't reality either. So you need someone who can take that stuff and filter it and come back to you and say, good idea, but perhaps maybe it's more about this. And they ask you some follow-up questions to your original thoughts. I think you need to have someone like that. That's super important. That's a great idea. 
do you recommend professional coaching as well or going to a religious organization, faith-based, or do you keep it local to family? Does it matter? Yeah, I think that's an individual individual choice. Uh, I am a person of faith, obviously, as someone who has served as a pastor in a local church, there is a faith element that's foundational to my life. And for me, it is centering, it is guiding, it, it brings a lot of things to light and helps me in tremendous ways. If you are not a person of faith and that's not where you want to lean in, I understand that, but having that outside perspective can be invaluable at times. So professional coaching, there are lots of career coaches out there who have, you know, years of experience behind that. I don't necessarily see myself as a career coach, but I am willing to help people walk through this in in cohort fashions. So if that's something that is helpful, absolutely, uh, I'm willing to to be in that space with folks. But I think having someone in your life, having an influence in your life that is not uh, so emotionally invested that they can't speak truth to you, I think is is absolutely part of what you need. And I would offer that's a large part of it is that emotional attachment as well, because sometimes coming from a coaching perspective, it is that external perspective that somebody outside can offer where if they are too attached, every now and then it can feed into one side or the other yes. that you were talking about where yeah. we're either in a cycle of negative self-talk and maybe that individual without meaning to is feeding into that cycle of negative self-talk or that overinflated talk of it's not a cycle of reality necessarily that others are going to perceive so i feel like there is a little bit just from my own observation a little bit of support that you can get by going to an organization or a coach or somebody who is seeing you outside of an internal family dynamic that is very, very close. Yes. So a spouse sometimes will give you directly what they're feeling and thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. I had a life coach uh, who has, was kind of reviewing some of these events in my life. And he asked me, like he knew what he was doing. He asked me, so are you upset about that? And I looked at him like, have you not been listening to what I've Of course I'm upset. I'm, I am, I am mad. I am super mad. I, you know, I listen to these things. He, and then he, he's like nodding. He says, you should be. And I was so stunned. What? You just gave me permission to be up. Are, are you sure? Is that, that's okay. And there was like this validation of my feelings that I never had experienced before. And I was like, okay. And I almost wasn't mad anymore because he just told me it was okay to be mad. But then he said the key piece to it. He said, how long are you going to be mad? And I was like, oh, I see what you did there. Nice. He just set me up for it. And it was the validation actually brought the freedom because I was like, oh, I don't need to be mad about that anymore. And it was okay. And, I, and it really has been a turning point for me that because of the validation, because he wasn't like a yes man to me, he said, yeah. Yeah, you should be upset about that. But like, turn the corner, man. Like, go ahead, move on now. Or, or how soon can you move on? And kind of putting it back on me uh, of, am I going to grow from that? I hated it and loved it within like 30 seconds. It was just like this amazing turnaround for me. So you need that kind of, you need that kind of pointed feedback about what's going on in your life. And that's where I see your book. Because it's so easy to sit in a job or a career, which are different, right? And just do about how much you hate it, yeah. but continue to live it. And you're saying in this book, all right, you can continue to live it, but if you're going to continue to live it, own it. Or what are you going to do next? What do you do? So one way or the other, you have to make a choice. You can't just sit in it and stew in it. Mm -hmm. You have to choose. Know that it sucks and you're going to stay or get to know yourself and make a plan and do something different. And I, that's empowering. Yes. Amber, I firmly believe that had I been more self-aware, 
if I had a better insight into who I was and why I was frustrated, I could have stayed at that job longer because I would not have brought my garbage in and made the tension. I was making the tension. I, it was coming out of me. I was the source. And if I would have known myself better, I probably could have been working there longer and had a smoother transition to whatever was going to be next. Because I was coming with a better attitude, I would, I would have been coming with, a, a, with more of myself as opposed to, or, you know, just kind of this like gruntled, just like unsatisfied, you know, mean guy. And that can help your transition. So if you're in a place where like my job sucks and I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go, I feel like I should quit today. Part of what I say in the book is like, time out, don't quit today. Don't quit today. Let's see if we can reshape kind of how you think about your, your future and inform your present so that you can stay there and keep a job or keep an income, if you will, but still live it and still be fine with it because you are helping, you are helping yourself paint that picture of what tomorrow can be. And what a beautiful message. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. There's a transition that can occur and you may find in the transition that your job isn't what sucked. It's how you were feeling in the moment that actually sucked. Yes. And once you're through that, that your job is actually something you can enjoy. And, and then people will enjoy working with you. Yeah. You might really like the people you work with. Right. And maybe there's another position within the same organization. There are all these opportunities that once you shift your perspective, everything else may fall into alignment. That's right. Now, you had mentioned a couple of times that you have a background as a pastor. Did that play any part whatsoever in how you approached this book? It did because in leaving the, the ministry in, in no longer being a pastor, there actually was a lot of guilt that I experienced and internalized from leaving that. And I don't have time to break all of that down except to say that I, while I knew that it was right for me at the time, I knew this was the step that I needed to take. I really felt like I was either letting some people down or I was somehow not fulfilling this, what is sometimes called a, a calling. I'm not fulfilling this calling because I'm leaving it and I have rejected it. Yeah, and that's a, that's a longer conversation for another day. But it was that guilt. It was that processing of this thing that I really felt like others expected of me. How do I create my own journey moving forward? I can definitely feel that. And from that heart-centered place where you are willing to transition and move forward and know what was a fit for you, even if there were still attachment feelings of what was anticipated of you. I would say that's part of what makes you a heart leader, someone who's willing to follow your heart and know your calling, even if that means that a path that others or even a part of you may have felt was a calling in a different direction. There's a stronger calling in another one. And this book, it sounds like may help so many people understand where they fit and what is meant for them. So when you hear us and me say to me, that actually makes you a profound heart leader, someone who can take all of that intellect that you have, all of that awareness, all of that knowledge, and blend it with such amazing heart and wisdom and share it with communities like ours who are integrated faiths and faiths from all over the world. What does that invoke in you? What does that feel like when you hear that? I think part of what I'm hoping this book does is that it helps people. It helps them pursue meaning in their life. And if I can accomplish that with a few people, then it will have been rewarding in that way. And that's ultimately what I'm hoping to accomplish is that I can help people take their, their best next step. 
because as a pastor, that's really what I was trying to accomplish then. And I still see that I still see that and feel that in my heart as that's what I want to try to do is help other people take their best next step. I cannot wait to purchase the book and to read all the way through it. I am so happy in my career, but that does not mean that there aren't opportunities for growth through the tools that you offer, even if I'm happy. There's so much we can gain from any and every resource. So I am really looking forward to it. As we wrap up, can you say one more time where individuals can get the book and how they can get a hold of you? The first place the book is going to be available is on Amazon, and you can uh, grab your copy there. Our website for more resources beyond the book is workchaos.com. And there are tools that are going to be available on workchaos.com. Yes. Well, and wonderful Sweet Vera community, we will make certain if you pop on over to our podcast site that it will all be listed there. Or if you watch on YouTube, it will be available there as well. So you can quickly just click and go to purchase the book or to get to Mark's website. Again, Mark Slaybaugh. He is writing this amazing book called My Job Sucks, Now What? And even if you are happy in your career, in your job, like I am, I have no doubt that there are going to be tools and techniques that you can take from it. But if you know someone who is seeking to remedy a dissatisfaction within their job or career, this might be a wonderful gift to give them. Thank you so much for tuning in. And Mark, thank you for being here. We appreciate you very much. Thank you, Amber. My pleasure to be a part of this. Uh, I hope we can have a conversation again soon. I very much enjoyed this. Likewise. And again, thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget, we have our free resource available for you to download. Just pop on over to our social media and send us a direct message with the word compassion. And we will make sure that you get the link to download this month's free journal. Until next time, I'm your host, Amber, and I look forward to seeing you in our Suivera community.